Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the exploration of the Messianic prophet, Isaiah. We'd like to thank you for joining us. I'm sitting with Bruce Watson, the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Uh, Bruce, will you catch us up uh, to where we are in our study, please? Uh, we're doing the end of uh, Isaiah's book, and uh, what we've been dealing with is in the last section is God is showing the prophet Isaiah a good future. Where are things headed? Um, and he keeps using the thing, the former things, you know, the way things have always been, versus I'm going to do a new thing. And, of course, we find out that, that he's going to send a mess, uh, messianic deliverer. He's going to be the suffering servant of the Lord. Uh, then in the last chapter we read, he said that he's going to have a servant people, and he's shown... Uh, in that chapter, that that's not going to just be Jews. It's going to be Jews and Gentiles. They're going to be his servant people. And he's going to give these servant people a new name. And that kind of introduces where we are in the closing verse of the last part of uh, chapter 65. Verse 16 says, For the past troubles will be forgotten and hidden from your eyes. They've gone through a lot of traumatic things as the uh, <clears throat> Judah had as the people of God with the Babylonian uh, conquest and exile. And so uh, so have many of us uh, gone through many uh, struggles in our life that we want to leave behind. And so he gives a vision for the future God in him. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Let's pick up at uh, Isaiah 65 and verse 17. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, but be glad and rejoice forever. Uh, let me go back there. The former things will not be remembered, remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight, and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. Bruce, what will God's future creative power and it's very interesting in this passage. He's going to give his servant people a new name, but he's also going to give them a new domain. God says, I will create. And this is the word uh, bara in uh, Hebrew that uh, is used exclusively of God's creative power. And it says that God is going to do again what he did to begin with in Genesis 1. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And so the future for God's people is not just to go to heaven when you die and that's the end of the story, but that eventually God's plan is a new heaven and a new earth. And he's going to have a new city uh, that's going to be there. It's going to be a new Jerusalem. And that's where he will dwell uh, with his people and his people will dwell with him. And so this new creative form from God. This is the future God is promising. And the former things you won't remember won't come to mind. And that kind of comes in later when he says um, the sound of weeping and crying won't be heard anymore. So associated with suffering and sin and the toils of life are the, are the crying and the moaning that goes on with people who suffer greatly. And he's saying in this new creation there'll be none of that. That will be eliminated. And it will be replaced by people full of gladness and rejoicing. There's nothing like having a glad heart and uh, rejoicing, expressing the joy that you feel inside uh, an occasion when you're doing that to allow you to forget the past. We've all gone through hardships and difficulties, things that to think about are painful and to remember. But he's saying in God's good future, we won't be remembering these anymore. We'll be caught up in the gladness and the joy of the Lord. And the Lord, Lord will also take joy in us as we rejoice in him. 
And so then he goes on to kind of talk about age. So in this future to come, he says, there'll be no more infant mortality. Um, today, we haven't eliminated infant mortality, but we have cut infant mortality down to a very small percent of the children in the developed world. Some parts of the world uh, don't have access uh, to good medicine and their rates are higher. But in the ancient world, one out of three children didn't live to age six. Can you imagine one out of, and people of course tend to have more kids back then, but one of the reasons for it is many times uh, their children died and they died quite young. Imagine the heartache that that brought to people in the ancient world. And until re really relatively recent times we developed medicine that could actually deal with some of these severe infections that kill adults and infants. And so he's saying in God's good future, infant mortality rate, that's going to be eliminated, what was a common thing in the ancient world. And the average lifespan of a person back in this time was about 32 years. That doesn't sound like much, does it? Some of, some of our uh, kids aren't getting out of the home until they're 30, 32. And if they croak, that'd be kind of a short-lived uh, absence from the home. And now we look at 74, 78 years, whatever it is, uh, on average that people are, are living to. And a dramatic change has occurred in the last century in regard to these things. And so I see that as part of the Messianic blessing he's referring to here. And he says, you know, somebody that dies at 100, only lives to 100, well, that's just going to be thought of, he must be cursed somehow. He didn't live longer than 100 years old. Well, we tend to look at the opposite. Rare is a person that lives 100 or more. Although, many are predicting we're going to have a fairly large number of people, much larger than we used to in this uh, century. Uh, again, perhaps... This is part of that messianic promise because, again, God gives some of the blessings now. When Christ came, raised from the dead, ascended to the Father, he sent his spirit, and we received blessings of the new age. We're living out this new age. However, the fullness of that hasn't come yet. There's not a whole new heaven and a new earth yet, not a new Jerusalem yet. And so there's still more to look forward to, but in the meanwhile, we're experiencing, I think in our own lives, the blessings that come about because of what God promised the future could be. Uh, and then he said, you'll build houses and live in them, you'll plant crops and you get to eat them. That sounds kind of simple, but in the ancient world, it was not uncommon at all for either you have a famine and have nothing to eat, or just as the crops come in, an enemy invades and steals your food, and you starve as a result of that. Uh, uh, enemy comes and conquers you. Uh, you weren't secure at all. You didn't know what was coming. You couldn't count on much of anything. Lifespans weren't long. Life was hard and arduous. And so he's saying, in the coming future, God is going to provide greater security. Uh, you'll no longer... Uh, plant things, and other people will eat those. Um, my chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. So he's envisioning a future uh, in which there'll be great fruitfulness and where people will be able to experience the benefits of their own labor. This sounds kind of like not much to us because we live in an age and a place where to some degree we can experience that. But much of the rest of the world isn't quite there yet. And uh, go 100 years ago, and uh, people were not experiencing that. So this is a great blessing that God is saying is coming in the future. And then he says, back to the age of people, for as the days of a tree, he says, uh, so will be the days of my people. He goes on to talk a little bit later, but I'm getting ahead of of where we are, so I better let you read some of the text. All right. Let's uh, let's move on to uh, verse seventeen, or okay. verse twenty-one rather. Mm -hmm. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. 
No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. They will not toil in vain or bear children doomed to misfortune, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. But dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. Bruce, what will this new age uh, of God's people be about? Yeah, it's exciting. Of course, I got ahead uh, of myself. I already got talking about some of this, the first part of this. That, you know, they'll build and plant things and get to live in your houses. <clears throat> you'll get to experience the, the fruit of your labors. And then about age, I like this. He said, you know, 100, if you die at 100, and people think, boy, you really had a, had a bad luck in life. Uh, but here he says, for as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. Now, that may not mean much to us. We, uh, some of the trees we plant don't last long. But uh, in that day, you know, the olive tree uh, is still known today to live sometimes 700 uh, to 1,000 years. There are some in Palestine now that we think, uh, for example, if you go to Palestine, they show you the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a tree garden, and there are olive trees there. Gethsemane met an olive press. Um, and there are trees there that they don't date back to the time of Jesus. That would be 2,000 years ago. But they have some in that garden they think are 700 years old. And they're still alive and still producing uh, uh, olives. So uh, the point is, it's almost a return to a time in the Bible when people lived much longer prior to the Noah's flood. So he's saying, you know, God's blessings are going to allow you to live in security, to be fruitful and, and, and share in what you've done, and to live long lives. Um, and he says, I will bless not only you, but your descendants. And that's kind of tied back into the uh, Abrahamic promise that God promises to bless all the nations and to bless his people in the future because uh, of the hope that is through Abraham and his seed, which is ultimately uh, the Christ. And so they will be blessed. And notice in this future age, before you even call, before, while you're still talking, I'm going to respond and meet your needs. Uh, in the age and the time we live, things don't work that way. You know, God is curtailed by human free will. He's curtailed by the fact that the serpent and Satan is still active and powerful and can thwart, short term, uh, God's purposes. He can't in the long term. But it sometimes takes God much longer than we would like, and I'm sure he would like, to sometimes answer our prayers and fulfill what he intends to do because he's working with human free will and uh, the powers of evil who have free will and he doesn't suspend those or else they couldn't be held accountable for what they did. And so, consequently, uh, in the future that he's promising here, he's saying something great is going to happen. He said, and look at the natural predators, the wolf predator for the lamb, or the lion pull down the oxen to eat. Uh, he says, they're all going to be friends in this world. The animal kingdom is going to be a feast. They're going to be calmly eating together, uh, not scared of one another. A kind of return to the Garden of Eden appeared to begin with, that animals weren't afraid of humans, and there was a much more peaceable world. But of course, uh, this elimination of the predatory thing is, is something that's only in the future. But we can see that in our own age. As, as I've seen some television shows where they show very opposite type of animals. Uh, growing up together, uh, becoming uh, pals and playing together. Uh, that just gives you an idea of what human beings can accomplish uh, when they try to work with God's wonderful creatures and God's good creation. And But remember back 
to the original garden and the sin, there was a curse that came upon the ground. And it was because of the serpent. And the serpent also was cursed and was no longer could walk but must crawl on the ground and therefore eat dust. And so he's saying here, in effect, the serpent is going to be subjugated. He's no longer going to be a threat. Even though we've turned to the Garden of Eden, we're not going to have a serpent that threatens the peace and harmony of the garden because we're going to see the serpent still eating dust. Uh, there'll be no harm nor destroying. In other words, the serpent's not going to be able in this new age to come to be able to do what he was able to do in the past because the Messiah is going to limit the powers of evil because in Christ's death and resurrection, he defeated uh, Satan and led the righteous out of paradise uh, to be in the presence of God. And so this is a great future. At the time of Isaiah, we're looking 600 years or more down a history before Jesus comes. And here we are 2,000 years after that, and the fullness of the new age, the fullness of a new heaven and new earth have not yet come, but we can see real changes, changes like Isaiah said would have come about uh, as a result of this new age and messianic age coming upon us. Okay. I'd like to, I think we ought to look at two passages. I just while I was thinking about this. First of all, let's look at Revelation 21. Uh, remember the uh, very beginning of what we looked at, talked about the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem and no more mourning. Could you read uh, uh, Revelation 21? It's clearly the writer is thinking about this and giving us more insight into that. Sure, beginning at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with, him, with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the older order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And so uh, John Apostle sees this great vision of the future, just as Isaiah had framed it, a new heaven, a new earth, because the old order and the old world has passed away. And this new Jerusalem is coming down to take its place on the earth. And, and the end result is God will live among his people. That behold, Jesus says, I'll make all things new. This is the great promise uh, that we have in the future. And so, as we look forward to this, uh, what we have to keep in mind is that as Isaiah saw it, so does the Revelator. He sees this day coming, and he sees the absence of a C, S-E-A. And of course, that always stood as a metaphor for uh, where evil came from. The serpent was supposed to be a sea serpent. What was he doing on the land, in the garden? You know, he was way out of place, and uh, Adam and Eve should have recognized that, but instead they were easily conned, and they were fooled. And so, again, the human race struggles with being deceived and fooled, but God sent the Messiah to try to bring back wisdom and knowledge and bring us back. And the whole point of the whole story was God created the world for him to have a relationship. Remember it said... Uh, God came walking in the cool of the day to have fellowship with uh, Adam and Eve, and they ran and hid because they'd sinned. So God wanted fellowship with us. He wanted to be in a right relationship. And then when we're in a right relationship with him, then he empowers us, teaches us true wisdom, so that we can take care of the creation, take care of the creatures, and 
do whatever God wants us to do and to be able to overcome all the potential obstacles and evils and problems that could exist in an earth. God uh, intends to work through us to do that and make a new heaven a new earth, we in cooperation with God. And so that's what Revelation sees as is coming. And then going back a little earlier in the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 11, he, he says a little bit of the same thing, uh, but a little different take on it. I think it would be interesting, the first six verses. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy with justice. He will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. Yeah, powerful vision again. At the end, you see all these creatures getting along, and then it says a child will lead them, which I think is another clear allusion to the messianic child that's actually referred to uh, a little bit earlier in the book of Isaiah. But what does he say? You know, here he says a branch is going to come out of the uh, stump of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. Thus, we're talking about the line of David. Why is that important? Because the promise of God was out of the line of David will come the ultimate anointed one, Messiah, Messianic King. And so the question is, well, how will he rule? Well, first of all, he's going to be filled with God's spirit. And he's going to operate on the principles of justice uh, for all. And he's going to create a new world in which even the animals are going to not be predatory, but are going to live in peace and a child shall lead them. So it's a great vision. Isaiah, over and over again, God gives him a great vision of what can happen, what the potential is. And it goes back again to the messianic core of uh, Isaiah. Isaiah sees this in a variety of different ways, but he sees it bringing about a new world and a new beginning. And that's the great promise of God. All right. Let's uh, resume back in Isaiah 66, beginning at verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things and so they came into being, declares the Lord? This is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. But whoever sacrifices a bull is like one who kills a man, and whoever offers a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. Whoever makes a grain offering is like one who presents pig's blood, and whoever burns memorial incense like one who worships an idol. They have chosen their own ways, and their souls delight in their abominations. So I also will choose harsh treatment for them, and will bring upon them what they dread. For when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, no one listened. They did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. Bruce, what, did this, what does this mean for God's temple? Yeah, it's very interesting. If you put yourself in the historical context of Isaiah, he's predicting the temple still functioning in his day, but he's predicting an end to the temple and destruction of Judah and carried off into exile. And so, of course, the attention of people of God after that was, when can we get back to our land? When can we rebuild our temple? Because the center of Judaism uh, was the temple of God. There, all kinds of sacrifices were offered that established uh, a right relationship with God, that 
uh, allowed for sins to be forgiven and for there to be a relationship in which God was the king and ruler who would show his favor on his people. And so at this time, of course, no one would envision a future without a temple of God in Jerusalem. And so Isaiah just sees such a strange vision uh, for this future, not a rebuilding of the temple. First of all, he says, you know, what does God have to say about that? He says, you know, heaven is my throne. Uh, he says that the earth is my footstool. Now, what's interesting there is several times in the Bible, it says that the Ark of the Covenant is God's footstool, which was in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And it also says the temple is his footstool. So the symbolism was that God as king of the universe was putting his feet down among his people in Jerusalem. So among the people of God, Judah and the Jews. And so that was a symbol of God's presence in the temple. But he's saying here, I'm just too big to fit in a house. Now, it's not like this is a new idea. Uh, even when they built the temple to begin with, Solomon recognized that you couldn't, you couldn't uh, house God in a temple, the great creator of the universe. Uh, you're not going to find an effective resting place for me, he says. Uh, and so he really challenges the whole vision of the temple. And uh, this could, uh, no doubt, was uh, uh, a passage that they uh, struggled with. Well, what in the world does he mean? But then he says, you know, what about, what is the purpose of the temple? A place to make sacrifices. He says, if people do make sacrifices in this future, it's going to be an abomination to me. It's going to be like they kill somebody. Uh, it's like uh, they worship idols. So he takes all the things they would normally do in the temple and says, these are an abomination to me. So he's talking about a future without a temple where sacrifices are offered in the traditional way. And in contrast, he says, who, who do I esteem? Who do I favor? Uh, those are people who are humble and contrite in spirit. You know, not the normal people, not the go-getters, not the people that have, you know, high self-esteem and think they're the beginning and end of all things, but it's the humble people, people that can be touched in their heart and spirit uh, to do the right thing. These are the people that God esteems, not people that are doing the ceremonial work. Or, you know, and again, Christianity can be reduced to ceremonial, going to the church building, you know, uh, taking the Lord's Supper, having certain songs sung, uh, you know, doing various things. It can all become a ritual and it doesn't touch our hearts and make us humble and contrite. And if it doesn't do that, then it's failed. Uh, I don't care whether you name Christ or you name someone else. You just simply name Yahweh. Uh, if you don't have a humble, contrite heart, you're not going to find favor and grace with God. And so it's a kind of forewarning that the temple even though it's going to be rebuilt, there's a second temple, is not going to be a permanent lasting place uh, for God. And he says for those that do try to keep this alive, there's going to be some harsh uh, treatment. You see, at the same, the same moment that God brings salvation, he's also going to bring punishment on the wicked. When Jesus returns, it's going to be a glorious day for those who love him. But for those who've been rebels, for those that have taken his name only in vain, this is going to be a disastrous moment. So the judgment of God always comes, both judgment for good, for those that are forgiven and loved of God, and a terrible moment for those who have actively been a part of the great rebellion against the will and purpose of God. And so here he just brings all of that out and and says, you know, the future isn't going to be that. And so as we look at it, you know, what happens in the New Testament? Well, it says the Gospel of John that when Jesus was born, he dwelt among us. But the word there is technically the tabernacle. So it's like God symbolized his presence among his people by the tabernacle, later the temple. So in the person, in the bodily presence of Jesus, God tabernacle and lived among the people. And so the future, what was the Garden of Eden? A time where we could walk and dwell with God. 
What did Jesus come? Full of the dwelling of God on the earth. What's the future? The future is being in a right relationship with God and us being able to dwell with God and God dwell with us. Our sins and our stubbornness and rebellion uh, have not made that possible. The forgiveness of the Messiah uh, provides a way for us to be forgiven and to enter back into right relationship. But it won't be about a physical temple. As a matter of fact, under the new covenant, it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the Spirit of God in all of those who believe in Him, a, a living temple uh, that God lives in now. And in the future, the same thing will be true. Um, why don't you read this? It's in uh, uh, Revelation. Um, a little later in the 21st chapter, I think about verse 22, he says uh, some important things that kind of, new heaven and new earth, no more crying, I'm going to make all things new. But a little later on, it says something important <clears throat> too in that chapter. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of, of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will any who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So, there are going to be certain type of people that are going to be in this new city, in this new creation. Not everybody's going to be there. God is going to weed out the rebellious, the uncooperative, uh, the self-centered. All those are going to be weeded out. And you're only going to have the humble and contrite of spirit and dwelling with God. But notice he says, no temple in this new Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the temple symbolized God's presence. And in the new Jerusalem, God is going to be present. And he's going to be the light for the city. And there's not going to be any night there. Um, and so the exciting uh, vision of the future is a place with no temple and a great future in which we can enjoy the presence of God. And that's what God's been intending all along. And he's had to deal with our rebellion, our sinfulness, and our foolishness, always trying to draw us back in to a loving relationship, a right relationship, so that we could be our true self, and so that God could dwell with us, and we could dwell with God. And that's the great purpose that Scripture talks about. And Isaiah got a glimpse of his potential fulfillment. All right. Well, Bruce, you've... Uh... We've covered quite a bit, and uh, we're, we're going to the to the end of our study. And uh, I want to thank you for the amazing insight that you shared with us uh, this evening. And I want to thank you all for uh, joining us as we've continued our uh, exploration of the Messianic prophet Isaiah. Let us go to God in prayer. Righteous and eternal Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, your many wonderful blessings. We pray that. Uh, all that we do and say is pleasing and acceptable to you. We thank you for the hope that you've given us in your son, Jesus Christ, and the promise as we walk faithfully in, in you and your son, Jesus, that we will spend eternity uh, with you in the absence of time and pure joy. Uh, bless us and keep us this night until we meet again in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone.